is a good group. <laughs> good morning. And welcome to the White House. Uh, my name is Tina Chen. I am, I have sort of many hats here at the White House. I am the Executive Director of the White House Council on Women and Girls. Um, I'm also an Assistant to the President and Chief of Staff to the First Lady. Um, and we are really thrilled to have you here today. Today is a really important day for us at the White House um, to really, first of all, thank you, all of you who have been such leaders and champions in the fight against human trafficking. Um, and then to, for us to come together to share sort of what we have learned, you know, important issues that we have been able to raise over the last several months here, um, and to learn from all of you as well and continue this dialogue and this fight against, as the President has said, you know, really modern day slavery, um, which we have committed in this administration to bring to an end. Um, this has really been one of the most, you know, um, important issues I think that many of us here in the White House have had the privilege of working on. Um, as the President said in September, he really rallied every part of the federal government, and you will hear today from our cabinet from across the federal government on the many issues um, and the many initiatives that they are working on together um, across domestically, internationally, to address human trafficking. Um, we have our faith-based leaders here as well with us today, um, and we're so pleased to be able to receive their report um, on this issue. Um, so without uh, much further ado, because we have a long day today, um, you will be emceed and guided through the day by um, the Chief Chief Technology Officer for the United States of America, Todd Park, who's right here. And you will hear Todd has been just wonderful bringing our technology partners into this and to how we can really deal with this issue um, in the modern um, communications age. Um, and then now it's my privilege to also introduce my good friend um, who's been le leading this charge here in the White House and across the government. Um, she's someone who's really been a champion for women and girls um, throughout the country and around the world, and especially an outspoken advocate on the issue um, against human trafficking. Um, the uh, senior advisor to the president and the chair of the White House Council of Women and Girls, my friend Valerie Jarrett. <laughs> Thank you, Tina. Good morning, everyone. We are just, thank you, <laughs> speaking up, that's what I like to hear. We are delighted to have you all here for our first ever uh, forum on human trafficking. And it's such a pleasure to be having it here in the White House, looking around the room, seeing so many leaders and advocates who have helped shine the light on this devastating, devastating issue, one of the gravest wrongs the world has known. And I just want to thank you all and start by giving yourselves a round of applause for everything you do each and every day. <laughs> the importance of this work has never been clearer to me than last fall when I was in New York uh, for UNGA and the Clinton Global Initiative. And the day before the President gave remarks at the Clinton Global Initiative, Tina and Ava and I visited <clears throat> a center in New York that helps uh, survivors of human trafficking. And we met a young woman named Emma Matu from Indonesia. When Emma was brought to the United States at the age of 17, she thought that she was coming to be a nanny. Instead, she ended up working 18-hour days, cooking and cleaning, and often beaten. But she escaped, and with the care of this amazing organization, she got back on her feet, not just back on her feet, but she thrived. Today, she's an advocate against trafficking, and she's even testified before Congress. And prior to the president's remarks at the Clinton Global Initiative, she met the president. And I will never forget the look on her face. She's about this tall as she was looking up at the president. And she said, I can't believe you care about me. He did care about both Emma and so many other people around the country and around the world who have had similar stories. And in his message to millions who heard his speech, he said, and I quote, we see you, we hear you, we believe in your dignity. President Obama told us that we need to recognize human trafficking for what it is, modern slavery. It's a, it's a debasement of our common humanity. It tears at the fabric of our society and it brings darkness into so many innocent lives. During his speech, the president announced a number of new administrative commitments to combat human trafficking at home and abroad. And the four elements of his strategy include 
preventing trafficking by raising awareness among vulnerable populations, leading by example in educating the public and first responders, prosecuting traffickers through strengthening investigations and enforcement tools, protecting survivors through comprehensive social services, family reintegration, and immigration services. In partnering with civil society, state and local officials, the private sector, and faith-based organizations to maximize both resources and, most importantly, outcomes. And it's because of his inspiring young survivors, survivors such as Emma that the President remains steadfastly committed to that ongoing goal of remedying this horrible ill on society. And it's why we're all here today, because we're determined to find additional solutions and put those solutions into action. So much of the progress we've made in the fight against human trafficking is because of everyone who's here in this room and those of you who are watching uh, our live stream. And so I'm especially proud of the coordination we've seen at the federal level. In May, the President's uh, Interagency Task Force to Monitor Combat and Trafficking was going to meet and review our accomplishments and, more importantly, set forth our goals for the future. And several members of those task force are either here or will be joining us. You'll be hearing in a moment from our Attorney General, Eric Holder. We'll shout out for Eric Holder. Glad you're here. Uh, Secretary Janet Napolitano will be here this morning. Uh, we also have Bill Corr, who's here, who's a, uh, with uh, the Department of Health and Human Services, our Deputy Secretary. Thank you for coming. We're delighted to have you here. A little recognition for <laughs> Bill Corr. So on behalf of the President, I'm pleased to announce today that we are taking significant new steps at the federal level, and you'll be hearing in more detail about these steps from our, on, from our speakers who will be coming next. We're developing a strategic action plan to coordinate and strengthen services to victims. We want those victims to turn into survivors. We're building public-private partnerships to provide cutting-edge technology for better enforcement of existing laws and to help victims apply for critical services. And just last month, the President uh, signed a bill, uh, the Vow of Violence Against Women Act, which also reauthorizes tra the Trafficking Victim Protection Act. So that's an important step as well. And today, later uh, this morning, our Faith-Based Advisory Council is holding a meeting here, and it will issue a report making certain recommendations of ways that uh, the government can better partner with faith-based organizations, secular organizations, to combat human trafficking. So we are making progress, but we all know we have to continue to be vigilant and forge ahead. And we are relying on each and every one of you to continue this fight with us. And it's why we are establishing the first presidential award to acknowledge those who have led the way to fight human trafficking. And in a few minutes, you'll hear a little bit more about that from some special guests. But I won't spoil it, but I do want to congratulate those who are at the forefront of this fight. When we're dealing with an issue as painful and as heartbreaking as human trafficking, it's really folks like you that give us the hope for a brighter future. And I say that not just as uh, a member of the Obama administration, but, but as a mother. And I think as we look at this, we see our children through the eyes of so many of the people who have suffered this travesty. And when you meet uh, these amazing people who have managed to turn their lives around, we have to think about those who haven't been able to do that. And so that's why they're counting on us. And so now, without any further ado, I'd like to, you to welcome to the stage uh, one of the key partners in this initiative, who also comes at this not just as the Attorney General for the United States, but as a father of two daughters as well. So please join me in welcoming General Holder. Oh, you want to walk up today? <laughs> Sorry for my entrance there. I didn't feel all right. Uh, good morning, and thank you, Valerie, for those, uh, those kind words. And I want to thank you all for, uh, for being here with us today. I'd particularly, particularly like to thank Secretary Janet Napolitano, uh, an old friend and uh, old colleague who has we worked together on a number of important things, uh, this chief among them, uh, Deputy Secretary Corps of the Department of Health and Human Services, Director Cecilia Munoz of the Domestic Policy Council, Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights and the Secretary of Labor Designate, Tom Perez. I'm going to miss this guy, although we'll be working together in a different way, I suppose. And each of our, our, our panelists for their leadership in combating 
uh, human trafficking across the United States and also around the world. I'm proud to stand with them today to discuss our, our joint efforts to strengthen this important work and to take our comprehensive anti-trafficking efforts to a new level. Now, as Valerie just said, and as President Obama has made, I think, abundantly clear, this constitutes a top priority for this administration at the highest levels. It is really an outrage, an outrage, that 150 years after President Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation and more than six decades after the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights outlawed glo the global slave trade, as many as 27 million people, 27 million people are held in modern forms of slavery around the world. That's more than at any other time in the history of the world. And it's why, thanks to dedicated professionals throughout the Justice Department, our colleagues at the Departments of Homeland Security and Health and Human Services, and leaders and experts like all of you, the administration is responding to this crisis not with despair, but with resolve and with robust action. Now, under the strategic action plan that we announced this morning, agencies across the federal government are reaffirming their dedication to cooperation as well as collaboration. Attorneys, analysts, researchers, investigators, and law enforcement officials are coming together as never before to study the latest trends in human trafficking. Over the next five years, this plan will enable us to reinforce our relationships with non-governmental allies and to build public-private partnerships. It will lead us to develop innovative new strategies for identifying, assisting, and seeking justice on behalf of those who are trapped in some form of slavery, bonded labor, or forced prostitution. It will improve our ability to work through the Justice Department's Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention and other components to safeguard young people who are at risk of being subjected to trafficking by being lured into prostitution. It will enhance our understanding of the challenges that we are up against by empowering the National Institute of Justice to conduct and to release at least 10, 10 in-depth studies of human trafficking. And it will equip us to reach out to uh, more trafficking victims and to increase support for legal and victim service providers by building on an initiative led by our Office of Victims of Crime known as Vision 21. Perhaps more importantly, this strategic action plan will serve as more than just a, a static framework. It will be a, a living document. And as we solicit public comments and as we move forward with its implementation, my colleagues and I will continue working with advocates like you to refine and to strengthen it. With the benefit of your support and with your close engagement, I'm really confident that this new framework will help us to open up a, a new chapter in this administration's fight against human trafficking. And it will send a, a strong message to anyone who would prey on their fellow human beings that human trafficking simply will not be tolerated. Our commitment to moving aggressively in identifying and in prosecuting human traffickers and supporting those who bring help and healing to victims has quite simply never been stronger. Over the last four years, this commitment has led the Justice Department to charge a record number of human trafficking cases, increasing forced labor and adult sex trafficking prosecutions by more than 30 percent. It has driven us to reinforce partnerships with domestic law enforcement allies, with foreign governments, with nonprofit organizations, and with many others, boosting our capacity to deter and dismantle trafficking networks that span jurisdictions as well as international borders. And it has inspired us to launch the Groundbreaking Anti-Trafficking Coordination Team, or ACT Team, innovative initiative and interagency collaboration among the Departments of Justice, Homeland Security, and Labor, aimed at streamlining federal criminal investigations and prosecutions of human trafficking offenses. Today, we have six Pilot Act teams, and they are fully operational. They're allowing us to develop and to advance high-impact prosecutions. But as we look toward the future of these and other promising anti-human trafficking programs, and although there is much to be proud of in the work that's underway and the impact that we've had in recent years, we cannot yet be satisfied. We cannot become complacent. The reality is that there is still a great deal of work that remains to be done. Only by working together will we ever be able to successfully implement and strengthen our new strategic action plan. 
Only by working together will we extend the record of progress that so many of you have helped already to establish. And only by working together will we continue to lead the global fight against human trafficking, restore the dignity, and reaffirm the humanity of those who have been victimized, and hold the perpetrators of these heinous crimes accountable. Now, I'm proud to count you as partners in these very critical efforts. I thank you once again for your commitment to this important work. And now I'd like to turn things over to Todd Park, who will move our program forward. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, General Holder, for your leadership in this critical fight. Uh, and it's now my great honor to introduce another uh, vital leader of the fight, uh, our wonderful Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano. Thanks, Todd. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody here, our partners and collaborators, as we deal with one of the real scourges of modern society. Um, uh, as all of you know too well, uh, human trafficking is a crime that is too often, as we say, hidden in plain sight. Uh, and it's one where I think too few victims have really gotten the help that they need. So your work uh, that you're doing, the work that you do today, the work that you're doing every day is critical to bringing the victims out of the shadows and helping us to bring the perpetrators to justice. As uh, General Holder mentioned, the draft Federal Strategic Action Plan on services for victims of human trafficking that we're releasing for public comment today, I think is an important step forward. It's been developed collaboratively with many of the departments and agencies represented here today, Justice, Health and Human Services. Uh, the White House has been very actively involved. And it's, it's uh, really intended to help better coordinate the whole field of human trafficking across this large federal government that we have where different agencies have different responsibilities. So take a look at the action plan. Give us your feedback. Now, uh, in terms of identifying victims, in 2010, I launched the Blue Campaign to fight human trafficking. Uh, this campaign has coordinated DHS's efforts to leverage our relationships with other federal agencies, including those with us here today, as well as state and local and tribal and territorial authorities and the private sector, NGOs, and international partners. Together in the Blue Campaign, we have now trained over 100,000 people likely to come into contact with victims to help enable them to spot human trafficking and to report it. Uh, this includes our DHS personnel, as well as local police officers who can re receive DHS training in person at events throughout the country or indeed online. It also includes flight attendants, Amtrak conductors, and transportation support personnel who we train in partnership with the Department of Transportation. We've developed an advanced training for members of the ACT teams, the teams that General Holder just referenced, to increase cooperation uh, amongst the federal agencies. And through this effort, the DHS Federal Law Enforcement Training Center, FLETC, in partnership with the ICE Academy and the Department of Justice and Department of Labor, delivered an advanced course for ACT team members, engaging them on some of the more complicated issues in trafficking cases from evidence gathering to obtaining appropriate search warrants. Um, we're going beyond this kind of training to enlist the public support and help as well. In addition to the online training that's already available, we will soon release a new public service announcement, posters, and other awareness materials. Uh, they will be available for anyone for display and for use um, in the hope that by increasing public awareness, uh, we also increase the number of eyes that are watching out and looking for signs of potential trafficking. Uh, last year alone, uh, and, in, and due to the outreach we were doing over the course of the past year, uh, we had a tip line, and the tip line received nearly 600 trafficking tips more than double the number than in 2010. So we know that when we have a tip line, we publish it, we get the public's awareness, uh, the public will help. 
The tips that we received actually produced results. In FY12, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, opened almost 900 cases, rescued 300 victims, and made over 950 arrests. In turn, prosecutors obtained over 380 convictions. Um, that's up from 300 arrests and 144 convictions in FY10. And we're continuing to press forward this year. Um, in one investigation just completed, Operation Dark Night, ICE, with assistance from DOJ and other partners, took down a multi-state prostitution ring operating in the southeast United States. And in the course of that, they rescued 11 victims and they indicted 25 suspects. Uh, many of the cases we saw in Operation Dark Knight are all too familiar to the people in this room. Women forced into prostitution with their children being held hostage to ensure their compliance. Um, but rescuing victims is only the first step in a long process of recovery. After they're rescued, we need to help the victims. As the agency charged with administering and enforcing the nation's immigration laws, one focus of our anti-trafficking work is on helping immigrant victims. Our victim assistance program served over 1,200 victims last year, ensuring that the victims got proper referrals for medical, mental health, and legal assistance, including for long-term immigration relief, case management, and other services. We are continuing to grow this program and have grown it substantially over the past two years, increasing the number of full-time specialists by more than a third. Combined with our victim assistance coordinators, we now have over 275 agents and specialists specially trained to assist victims, and they're at every, at every field office nationwide. Uh, and since our frontline law enforcement partners have an important role to play in victim assistance, we also are training them on how to help get victims the immigration relief they need. So while we've made progress in identifying and assisting victims, we know there's more work to do. We have a lot on our agenda. We will continue working to get more trafficking-related tips, increase investigations and prosecutions, and improve victim services by helping to finalize and implement the strategic action plan that you heard about today. For example, uh, we are now working with law enforcement partners to train more frontline personnel in more cost-effective ways. Just this week, the Nevada Department of Public Safety and the Nebraska State Patrol became the seventh and eighth state police partners to make our interactive online course available to their officers to help them identify the potential victims of human trafficking. And at the same time, uh, we are working on the immigration process itself. Uh, today, and let me commit to you that we will update our regulations to streamline the T visa process and to provide clearer guidance on how to obtain this non-immigrant status. We will begin, we will continue to do this while ensuring the integrity of the overall immigration system. And by the way, let me just pause there. We also hope uh, and are very supportive of a bipartisan effort at comprehensive immigration reform. And we need to make sure that things like T visas and those processes are properly uh, included in such legislation. So we're watching out for that, and I suspect so are some of you. <laughs> um, and uh, at the same time, I think we need to work on innovative new ways to fight the problem at its source to pre prevent people from even being trafficked in the first place. Um, we are launching and have launched a public awareness campaign warning children and families in select countries about the dangers posed to children in attempting to illegally immigrate, including the danger of being a humanly trafficked victim. So uh, these are some of the steps we've been taking. Uh, I look forward to uh, continuing our collaboration with partners such as you at home and abroad, and the international aspect of this cannot be overlooked. Uh, and we want to do even more. Uh, I have fought human trafficking and exploitation of women and girls at the federal and state levels over the course of my career. And I believe that this, um, this fight is a responsibility 
we all share, uh, everybody in this room, everybody outside it. Working together, we can do better. We can do even more than we've done before. And that's the commitment that we all should be making here today. So thank you for working with us. Thank you for the efforts and collaboration you are extending. And with that, I will conclude my report to the committee. Thank you. So welcome everybody, and as uh, was said earlier, uh, the first uh, awarding of the Presidential Award for Extraordinary Efforts to Combat Trafficking in Persons um, is something that uh, we are very happy uh, to be able to uh, deliver on. This is something that uh, was authorized by the Trafficking Victims Protection Act a few years ago, with, which authorized the President to recognize excellence in the fight against human trafficking. It reflects what we've learned since the early stages of this fight. When I was assigned to my first trafficking case, before we called it trafficking, my supervisor called me into the office and said, you know, this group, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, keeps coming in and talking about this one crew leader. And we've never been able to, to prove anything on him, but where there's smoke, there must be fire. And we went out and we were able to investigate that case in conjunction with the non-governmental organizations, working across interagency lines, working with the private sector, working with folks from every sector and harnessing their efforts to take Miguel Flores off the streets. But where there was smoke, there was fire. And that little spark has ignited a movement. Secretary John Kerry, as a senator, was a strong supporter of this fight. Years ago, as a prosecutor, was a leader in developing the victim witness coordinator positions and the structures that we now take for granted for victims' rights in America. Unfortunately, he was called away for important international travel and was not able to be here today. But he sent us a video talking a little bit about how he sees this fight, especially in light of today's award. If we could play the video. Good morning, everyone. I'm really sorry that I'm not able to be with you today to celebrate some of the real heroes in the fight against modern slavery. I think you know that I'm traveling to the Mideast and to a ministerial meeting in London, but I wanted to be able to share with you all personally how committed I am to this struggle and how grateful I am for all of your tireless efforts. Here and around the world, trafficking in persons destroys lives. It threatens communities. It creates instability. It undermines the rule of law. And it is a horrendous assault on our most dearly held values of freedom and basic human dignity. We, along with every nation, bear the responsibility to confront modern slavery by punishing traffickers and helping survivors get their lives back on track. This issue is one that demands our intense focus and it's been important to me for a long time now. As a prosecutor years ago, I learned firsthand how the victims of sexual violence are often violated by the system, if it responds at all. I saw personally the look in their eyes when they wondered whether they'd ever be treated fairly in the courts or see their abusers brought to justice. As chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, I'm proud that we held the committee's first ever hearing on trafficking in order to shine light on the reality of this modern slavery and to put it on the agenda of the Congress and of the American people. And now, as Secretary of State, I am deeply committed to building on those efforts. So is President Obama. Under the President's leadership, we have ramped up investigations and prosecutions of trafficking cases. We've expanded our diplomatic engagement around the world, and we've developed a new action plan to provide assistance and services to survivors, 
and supported new innovations that will improve the way that we respond to this crime. As chair of the President's Task Force on Trafficking, I intend to keep up this momentum, to grow it, and to move our efforts forward. Of course, we all know that government alone is not going to solve this problem. And that's where all of you, our partners, come in. Whether you represent a civil society group helping victims on the ground, or a corporation working to eliminate trafficking from its supply chain, or a faith community spurring a congregation to action, the work that every single one of you are doing every single day is making a huge difference. With this presidential award, we honor those who have played an extraordinary role in advancing our common cause. They've been pioneers in this effort, from developing the 3P approach of prevention, protection, and prosecution in the earliest days of the movement, to championing innovations in corporate social responsibility that will help to carry this work forward for years to come. This award pays tribute to their leadership and to their commitment. So let me close by simply saying thank you to all of you. Thank you for all that you have done, and I ask that you stay focused on this critical task. With your continued support and dedication, we are moving closer and closer every day to our shared vision of a world finally free from slavery. One person who's never shied away from that task and has never lost the focus to fight for the most vulnerable is with us today, and that's Cecilia Munoz, from the director of the Domestic Policy Council. Um, she coordinates domestic policy making processes here in the White House. Um, there is, are few people who know more about the policy choices and decisions that affect the vulnerable communities here in the United States. And it's my honor to ask her to come up to help us give this first award. And I'll also, as a point of personal privilege, simply say that if we had this much good Michigan talent <laughs> last night, <laughs> things might have changed. <laughs> so thank you for that kind, if slightly painful, introduction. As you heard, I'm a, I'm a Michigan person. He's got maize and blue on. We'll all survive this. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, but just in addition to being grateful for the kind introduction, uh, I just want to start by expressing my gratitude to all of you. And it is um, quite a moving thing to be engaged in this work. I, it's an honor to be engaged in this work. And it's especially an honor to um, uh, be part of a group that includes so much of this president's cabinet, which includes the president of himself, of course, uh, and which includes all of you. Um, it's hard to imagine anything more important that we could be doing. So um, I have the really wonderful privilege of, of, of starting by thanking you and of presenting the very first presidential awards for extraordinary efforts to combat trafficking in persons. So our first recipient, Flori Burke, is widely known for her extensive career in the fight against human trafficking. She's a founding member and current chair emeritus of the Freedom Network USA, which is a network of 30 organizations and individual experts dedicated to ending modern slavery through victim services, public awareness, advocacy, and partnerships. She's been a consultant to the US government as well as to NGOs. She's participated in extensive training programs and spoken on issues of human trafficking, trauma, and torture in national and international settings. And she served as an expert witness in several high-profile cases involving human trafficking, has been part of three working groups to help develop materials for first responders and others who may encounter victims of human trafficking, including the DOJ-funded Anti-Human Trafficking Strategy and Operations e-Guide. Flori Burke first started working to combat human trafficking in 1997 when she designed and implemented specialized social services for 60 deaf Mexican citizens who were enslaved in a peddling ring in New York City. She went on to help start the anti-trafficking program at Safe Horizon, an organization that focuses on providing victim services and raising public awareness. A true hero indeed, ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Flory Burke. So you stay, 
right here. Our next awardee, Carlson Companies, has been trailblazing leaders in exemplifying private sector activities on the issue of human trafficking. Headquartered in Minneapolis, Carlson encompasses more than 1,300 hotels in operation and development in more than 80 countries and territories, more than 900 restaurants in more than 60 countries and territories, and a majority stake in Carson Wagon Travel, the global leader in business travel management, which operates in more than 150 countries and territories. Carlson became the first U.S.-based global travel and hospitality company to join the Code of Conduct for the Protection of Children from Sexual Exploitation in Travel and Tourism in 2004, and they paved the way for several other major U.S. travel and tourism providers to sign the code and join the fight against human trafficking. In 2010, Carlson also signed the United Nations Global Compact, further demonstrating their commitment to human rights. Please join me in thanking them for their leadership and congratulating Carlson's chairman of the board and the driving force behind their trailblazing anti-trafficking efforts, Marilyn Carlson Nelson. Thank you again, Flory and Marilyn, for your commitment to ending human trafficking. We really couldn't achieve success without the involvement of partners like you and your leadership. So again, thank you on behalf of all of us here at the White House. So it should be clear to this group um, uh, how committed the President is um, on this issue. It was reflected very clearly in the speech he delivered at the Clinton Glo Global Initiative last summer. In that speech, the President not only put names and faces to the survivors of human trafficking, which I found so inspiring, but he laid out a policy blueprint for how this administration will continue and expand its anti-human trafficking efforts. And I'm proud to report that collectively we've made great strides accomplishing many of these goals over the past year. The White House and our partners across the agencies that you've heard from are developing the first ever government-wide strategic action plan to strengthen services for trafficking victims, a plan that will be comprehensive, action-oriented, and designed to address the needs of all victims. I want to extend our appreciation to all of the federal agencies that have participated in the White House policy process, especially HHS, DOJ, and DHS, who have led the development of the plan. It's really it's an extraordinary thing to see this kind of cooperation happening across federal agencies. And I promise you the depth of commitment that you all feel to this work is shared. You heard it from our cabinet secretaries. You've obviously seen it in the career and work of Ambassador DeBaca. Um, and you'll hear it again from the agencies that you're about to hear from on the panel. This is, we, we know how deeply committed you are to this, and I promise you that we share that commitment and are working in ways that break down some of the barriers that exist within the federal government to make sure that we're hitting our marks and doing our part in this extraordinary effort. We've made great progress in better assessing data. The Interagency Human Smuggling and Trafficking Center is conducting data analysis that will enable both law enforcement and service providers to deploy resources more effectively. And we're trying to build more partnerships to, cross, to combat trafficking across business, across nonprofits, across educational institutions, across foundations. Over the past year, the President's Advisory Council on Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships has focused its efforts on this issue. On, uh, on identifying opportunities to improve and expand partnerships with faith and community-based groups. And tomorrow, I'm happy to say they are going to release their final report of recommendations. And of course, as many of you know, the White House, and specifically the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, under the leadership of the President's Chief Technology Officer, the amazing Todd Park, is leading, and you'll see that he's amazing, because um, you're about to hear from him. He's leading the way in finding innovative technology solutions to help in the fight. So again, I just I want to thank you for everything you're doing. Make sure it's clear to you that you have uh, willing and energetic partners all across the federal government. Um, and we look forward to the continuing work that we have to do together. And um, to help us talk about that work, 
It is now my great pleasure to introduce the also amazing Bill Corr, who serves as the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, where he leads the agency's work on the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, but is also part of a team of individuals who have been steadfast in their dedication to this issue. So let me welcome Bill Corr, as well as the first panel. Good morning. It's, um, thank you. it's a real pleasure for me to join this distinguished panel. We're going to talk just a little bit about building a comprehensive victim-centered approach to combating trafficking. And I want to begin by introducing our panelists. It's certainly my pleasure. First, to my left, Ema Matul. You've heard her being talked about this morning already. A survivor and advocate who has provided valuable input to <clears throat> anti-trafficking policies as a member and coordinator of the CAST National Survivor Network. Welcome, Ema. It's nice to have you here. Also, we have Susie Stern, the National Campaign Chair Designate of the Jewish Federations of North America. And today, she's joining us also in her capacity as Chair of the President's Faith Advisory Council. Thank you so much for being with us, Susie. And of course, you've already met uh, our Ambassador, Louis C. DeBaca, Ambassador at Large to Combat trafficking, and also the director of the State Department's Office to Monitor and Combat Trafficking in Persons. Let me begin very quickly by reminding you that today we opened up the comment period for the five-year strategic action plan on services for victims of human trafficking. You heard Cecilia speak about it. Also, I think the Attorney General mentioned it, and Secretary did as well. Um, we have a 45-day comment period you can uh, go online to www.acf.hhs.gov, ACF standing for Administration for, Community, uh, for Children and Families uh, at the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, we need and want your input. We need and want you to engage with us, provide us input, help us understand how to improve the strategic action plan, make sure that we're coordinating fully inside the government, outside the government. Um, give us your input. Uh, let's begin with uh, a question to Ema. Ema, you, would you share with us how your experiences have informed your policy work and the recommendations that you've made on how we can improve systems that serve survivors of human trafficking? Um, All in just a moment. Um, well, <laughs> I don't need to share my story because um, my story already been mentioned. And um, the reason why I'm doing this work because I want what happens to me, I don't want to happen to anybody else. And also um, helping um, survivor or victim to become a better advocate and inspire them. I think. <laughs> Talk a little bit about the services that, that matter most. Um, the services that matter most, it's um, support and, um, you know, we all need a shelter and, you know, social services, case management, but support is the most important for a survivor. Thank you. Your um, insights, Ema, are invaluable, and as the President said to you uh, in New York, you're an inspiration for all of us, so thank you. Susie, uh, the faith community has played a leadership role in fighting human trafficking. And as chair of the President's Council, I understand that you all have come forward at his request with a set of recommendations on how to tackle this problem. And in fact, you're making your report available to the President today. So tell us a little bit about the recommendations that are coming forward. I will. Um, first of all, thank you for having us on this panel today. Um, and thank you for what you do. Um, you're a real inspiration. Um, I also want to give a shout out to my fellow council members who have been extraordinary um, in this process and to Mara Vanderslice Kelly who has led us to this day. 
I would like to tell you that I have these recommendations memorized on a t-shirt. Um, I was up also last night, all night long, in tears at the end of the Michigan game. I was at the Final Four on Saturday. <laughs> So while I should have been memorizing all of these, they're actually, I was cheering for Michigan. Um, the report is out literally hot off the presses. Um, our group, actually, it, it's very interesting because we came to this in July not really understanding the extent of the trafficking situation, in, particularly in this country, or the impact it had on our own congregations and our organizations. And so that's where we began, and we really have been on a journey together as we've learned from people like you and people who, um, like the people honored here today, who are the real heroes, uh, the new abolitionists in the field. So we thank you, all of you, for what you have taught us and for what you do every day. Um, our role has really been to try and figure out where the faith community and the nonprofit community, um, what role we have in partnerships. And one of the things, I, our recommendations, we have 10 of them, which I'll go over some of them in a minute, but in broad strokes, we know that if our level of awareness was so low that the public's level of awareness was, was extraordinarily low. So first of all, we think people need to know that this exists and it needs to exist in our own communities, in our own towns, in our own communities. We need to, have people care about it, not only know about it, and the, and the uh, code of silence. I was at the Women of the World Conference this, uh, earlier this week, or last week, and someone said, the code of silence must be broken. And, and that's really true. But not only must it be broken, we need to care about this. We need to make people care about this. And then we have to give people concrete things that they can do. And so that's really sort of where our recommendations begin um, from our experience. And then we felt that we in the faith community, in the neighborhood community, uh, community, we needed to be that voice of moral outrage. It came over and over in our meetings. Um, we needed to be the voice for people who have no voice, who cannot cry out. We need to be that voice. And so that's where we begin these recommendations. Recommendations, um, which um, which we present today, and as I said, the report is out there. Um, so we begin by saying um, that we uh, we are asking, we're recommending that the White House and President Obama lead the effort to dramatically elevate and bring to scale the fight against modern day slavery at home and abroad. We know that there are incredible things being done all over the country, but in terms of the numbers, 27 million, which uh, Attorney General Holder mentioned, it is not, we're not beginning to scratch the surface. So um, we learn from many of the leaders that um, this field is woefully underfunded, under-resourced, and so we recommend to the administration that they commission a comprehensive study to better understand what levels of funding are really needed, uh, either governmental or non-governmental, to really effectively counter um, trafficking in person so that the funding decisions are truly made based on need. We'll also recommend that the, that the administration convene a private, private philanthropists, businesses, other governmental organizations, global civil society, to discuss ways to dramatically increase the resources to fight this um, modern slavery. And sort of envisioning a, to the creation of a global fund to eradicate slavery inspired really by the success of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and, and Malaria. And this would really bring the key philanthropic organizations, religious, non, uh, both religious and non-secular nonprofits and governments to join in this fight to eradicate slavery. So that's sort of where we begin. We need to grow the sector. That's first and foremost. We also talk um, about having a summit um, that would be convened by the White House and to announce a national um, plan of action. Um, let me just I'll go over the points there. Uh, that national plan of action, which we would create and through the Office of Faith-Based Neighborhood Partnerships, create toolkits so that faith organizations, uh, nonprofits, community organizations would have the information available to them. We're talking about raising awareness. We're talking about educating and publicizing how to spot and report signs of trafficking uh, to the National Human Trafficking Resource Hotline. We're talking about um, using or denominational and organizational purchasing strength to demand slave-free supply chains through campaigns such as Made in the Free World and the Fair Food Campaign. We're talking about promoting ways that congregations and non-governmental organizations and family can use their purchasing power to demand slave-free chains. We're talking about using our congregations and organizations to help partner to fill the gap in services that you spoke about for survivors. 
We're talking about galvanizing the talent within our communities, our congregations, law enforcement, lawyers, healthcare professional, professionals, to begin to engage in action and raising awareness and enforcing the laws and providing services. We talk about setting up training led by survivors so that we can understand the sensitivity of how we deal with survivors. There, it's a very different, we have, we have learned, way of, it's, you can't throw them in a, in a survivor in a regular shelter. They need special kind of treatment because of the situations that they have gone through. We want to have training throughout the um, religious and nonprofit world, overseas to missionaries, international religious leaders, youth leaders. We want to demonstrate how faith-based and community groups can curb the demand for commercial sex in their communities and their congregations. And we want to begin to advocate for the promotion of state and local anti-trafficking laws, such as, the anti, uh, such as the safe harbor laws. So that's where we are. Um, we have a lot of other things, but um, that's sort of a, the broad strokes. In addition, we were told that you know, we, just, we have to focus on labor trafficking as well. Um, um, because that, while some people and some think, well, that's not such a big thing, we do know that it is a very serious issue. So that we are recommending that the White House and the U.S. government lead the effort to eliminate slave labor in the purchase and consumption of goods and services. Most of us um, don't see it, but every um, slavery touches everything that we do, the clothes that we wear, the food that we eat, and the phones that we use. Most have been produced with trafficking or, sex or slave labor. Um, because to date, there is not really a clear way to find or, t uh, or purchase goods that are not produced with slave labor or to identify the companies that have eliminated slavery in their supply chains, we believe that the federal government needs to lay out clear and fair guidelines for companies to monitor for and eliminate slavery in their supply chains and labor recruitment. The President's executive order to eliminate human trafficking in, the fe in federal contracting, with, with that happening, the U.S. government will become a worldwide leader in taking steps to eliminate modern-day slavery from its own contracting and procurement practice. We are recommending building on that existing effort to create a set of standards that companies, including those not contracting with the federal government, can use to measure themselves against and track progress in evaluating, monitoring, and eliminating forced labor from their supply chains. And we would like to encourage companies to help verify business practices and to put those anti-slavery standards in their trainings and certifications and to promote these uh, standards to the business community. We look at the success of the Energy Star label as a guide to a similar label that would tell us that people who make our goods are not trapped in slave labor. Um, in another area, we're sort of looking a little more inside the beltway, but we believe that the federal government needs to elevate the anti-trafficking work in an agency level. We are uh, recommending a full-fledged and standalone office to counter trafficking in per per person excuse me, at the Health and Human Services to create the capacity to coordinate an agency-wide response across sectors inside and outside the agency. And within the State Department, we are asking and we are recommending that the U.S. Department of State's office to monitor and combat trafficking in persons uh, be elevated to a bureau to increase its ability to lead its global effort to end modern-day slavery. From people in the field overseas, they said and they reminded us that slaves by definition are the most powerless people in the world. And they said that that State Department office to monitor and combat trafficking in persons is one of the only locales within the government that speaks for them. So we believe it's important to elevate this bureau, to, this to a bureau, to give that bureau, uh, to give J. Tip, I guess it's called, <laughs> uh, leaders a seat at the table where the most critical um, decisions are being made. So those are, uh, we have others. You want me to quickly go over the others or well, take we, a breath? I'm a, unfortunately. Because <laughs> I have my T-shirt ready. <laughs> I know that in this room, certainly uh, more than any other place, that we could have an incredible hour-long discussion about all of those recommendations. But let's, um, we'll give everyone a chance to read those. Um, let me just say on behalf of the administration that uh, when a council takes on a responsibility like the president has asked you all to take on and comes back with this kind of in-depth report, it's exactly what we need. So on behalf of the administration, thank you and all the council members for the work that you've done. Ambassador DeBacco, you have um, seen this 
in many parts of the world as well as here in the U.S. Tell us a little bit about the administration's efforts in communities around the world. Well, I think one of the things that's, that's important for us when we're looking at the fight against modern slavery is that on the one hand, we need to make sure, in that case, for instance, that I mentioned earlier, that we are cleaning up the tomato fields of southeast Florida, but recognizing that a Guatemalan man who, or a woman who's enslaved here in the United States to pick our fruit may have a brother or a sister back home who's in sex slavery, who's in uh, labor trafficking, um, that we are part of a, a much bigger world. And so that notion, since the year 2000 with the creation of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, that we have to fight slavery here at home, but also around the world. There's a, a number of, of folks will come to us, and usually around the time that the, the annual Trafficking Persons Report comes out, and usually it's countries that maybe aren't as happy with their ranking on the report as they could be, and will say, in effect, you know, how does the United States get the right to tell us about how we should be uh, doing on this particular issue. And we don't see it as a, res as a right, we see it as a responsibility. Uh, as one of my former bosses said once, uh, written in the blood of all of those who suffered under chattel slavery when it was legal for 300 years in the United States, a responsibility to step up and work with our partners around the world to eradicate this scourge once and for all. In doing that then it means the kind of things that we've been doing here today in this room, encouraging folks to listen to survivors. It's hard enough in the United States where you've got a, a culture in which people in law enforcement and in uh, policy spheres are more inclined to bring in the affected community when they're making decisions about them. In other parts of the, the world, the notion that a, uh, a Burmese girl in Thailand would ever be listened to, much less brought into the policy sphere. Uh, the notion that a Roma child in uh, England uh, would be seen as anything other than a street vagrant or a small criminal, as opposed to saying, okay, if we're going to do something about child begging, let's listen to the voices of the kids. So a lot of what we're doing at the State Department now is to try to deliver on what Secretary Kerry said, trafficking victims deserve to see their abusers brought to justice and to have a role in that. And so the, Looking at that, then, we've recognized that victim rehabilitation as a part of a law enforcement response, as well as a social services response, is critical. So that's really the vision that we're pushing out around the world. We do it through programs. We do it through training. We do it through di diplomacy. If I could stand on my head, I'd probably do it through standing on my head. We don't want to see that. But, you know, I think we will do whatever it takes because this truly is an American call to action. When 150 years ago, the 13th Amendment um, was promulgated, that notion that slavery and involuntary servitude shall never again exist is something that was not a one-time thing. It's a call to action for us today. Thank you, Lou. I'm sure that what we've done is succeed in getting you ready to jump right into this conversation, and I wish we had time. So, but I'm going to need to close the panel with this question that I'd like to put to each of the panelists. If we could coordinate all the resources in this room, the energy, the commitment, the dedication, the, the efforts that people are going to make, if we could focus it all, um, what would be the first priority for our resources and our focus for you, Ema? Um, well, we, we have to look at um, trafficking to, through, like, what is cost trafficking? You know, what is caused the first place? Why people being trafficked to this country? Or, you know, like, why, like, young girl has to fall into, like, sex trafficking? Um, we have to look at poverty. You know, we have to look at education. We have to look at violence, you know, because there's so, uh, because of poverty, like in other country, for example, you know, that's why it makes, people wants to migrate to this country and fall into, you know, like a slavery. Thank you. Thank you, Ema. Susan. I don't think any, any of us should talk after that. <laughs> <laughs> there is something somebody said at one point, which is, we did something 25 years ago with the area of domestic violence, when people said, 
well, that doesn't happen. We don't know much about it. And through our advocacy, through screaming, through saying, yes, it does happen. It's happening in our neighbor's house. It's happening with our families. Um, we made people care. We made people, and it isn't acceptable. And we created a movement. And I think um, one of the things we need to do is to say, this is happening in your own communities, in your own neighborhoods. This is happening perhaps to members of your own family. It's not something that's happening far away. It's something our, commission, our council learned. And we need to be able to say this is not acceptable at any level, in any way, sex trafficking, labor trafficking, and, and, and to do really what we did with domestic violence 25 years ago, saying this is not acceptable, and in no sector of the society will this be allowed. And I, and I hope that, that we, can, we can do that with all of us working together. So, I think a lot of it comes down to institutionalization, and I think that that's one of the things that we're um, very interested in the, the council's challenge. It's not just a report, it's a challenge to all of us in the administration. And that really is that notion of how do we institutionalize this fight. Um, again, going back to that first case that I, that I mentioned earlier, I think it was one of two trafficking cases that were done that year by the federal government, and I happen to be assigned to the second one as well. It can't be one person or one little office or something that is so unique that the person who does it becomes the national expert. It needs to be something that permeates our culture, law enforcement culture, emergency room culture, the social workers, the universities, just as sexual violence and um, the response to domestic violence and those other things have become normalized. An entire generation of prosecutors and police officers know that when they see it. The generation that said, oh, well, that's just a family affair, I don't want to deal with that, that generation has passed from the, the stage at this point. And the folks who come up just simply think, well, this is what you do when there's a domestic violence case. That's where we need to get to with this fight. It needs to be part of all of our lives so that people are coming out of the, the colleges and can say, you know, I want to go work on the fight against slavery, and there's a job for me out there. There's an institution for me out there. There's a place where we can go and pick up the sword and march that march to freedom. I know that these three outstanding people have captured much of what you're thinking and feeling. The time that I can turn it over to you, unfortunately, is not now, but it is the next 45 days. We have a five-year strategic, strategic, strategic action plan that is now available on the website. It is the one very important time that we need your engagement. Give us your thoughts. Make recommendations to us. Our three departments are co-chairing, HHS, uh, the, attorney, the uh, Justice Department, and Homeland Security, are chairing the effort to develop this strategic action plan. We need your advice on how to make this a comprehensive approach that shares our common values for human freedom, but most importantly, gets us and you organized so that every moment, every part of our efforts are coordinated and focused and will be successful. So I wish we could open it up to you, but please open it up by commenting on our action plan. And join me in thanking our panelists, not only for the work they do in and out every day, but for being here with us today.